Welcome to lecture 10. This lecture is on plant nutrients, a plant's perspective. This is part of the Soil and Science and Plant Nutrition subject ALM 114, which is offered at the Educational Institution of North, Mel North Melbourne Institute of TAFE. Please visit our website www.nmit.edu.au for more information on this subject and others that we offer. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley and this lecture was written with input from myself and Dr Doug Rao. In this lecture we will look at a few components that are important from a plant's perspective. These will include what is an adequate nutrient level, the role of roots in nutrient uptake and optimization, and we will end with the consideration between physiology and crop commercial commercialization. Nutrients, as we, as we have discussed, have essential roles of the in the physiology processes in plants. One of the things that we have to consider is what is an adequate, what is a limiting, and what is an excess concentration. An adequate tissue level is a species-specific requirement, although we can produce a generic table which outlines what this should be most of the time. The environment will influence these adequate tissue levels. That is because the environment can greatly impact on relative growth rates, and this can impact on adequate tissue levels. And the soil environment will also influence the impact of the availability on nutrients and therefore the adequate tissue levels. The macronutrients are the nutrients that are required in higher concentrations. The following slide illustrates on a percent basis the adequate tissue levels. Nitrogen is required in a higher concentration than sulphur and this is in fact reflected by some of the groupings. Nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus are the primary macronutrients while magnesium, calcium and sulphur are the secondary macronutrients. The following slide illustrates the adequate tissue levels for micronutrients. Remember that these are only a guide and different species will have different requirements. As you can see, sodium is required in a higher concentration than molybdenum. The four R nutrient stewardship is a concept that defines the right source, the rate, time and the place for nutrient application of those producing the economic, social and environmental outcomes. Therefore, what is desired by all stakeholders to the soil plant ecosystem? Before our nutrient stewardship concept is spreading to many sectors of agriculture, including farm level practice, nutrient management education and research programs, and the development of government policy. Its utili utility will be enhanced by those employing to use terminology consistently and follow a more general structure. The preferred core expression for referring to the four R's is the four R nutrient stewardship. The term 4R fertilizer studioship comprises a subset depending on the sample principles. There are four components. The four nutrient stewardship should acknowledge all of these four components. They are source, rate, time and place. You can use this figure or this concept to think about your own nutrient management practices. Critical concentrations are often used to know the relationship between plant growth and yield and the nutrient concentration of the plant tissue. In particular, nutrients, nutritionists need to know the critical concentrations of nutrients below which growth yield is reduced. The figure on the screen shows the relationship of growth or, or yield against nutrient concentration in plants. This defines zones, the adequate zone the zone where plants are in deficiency, and then zones where plants are in toxicity. These will vary for species, but the pattern tends to be generic to all plants. 
Nutrient concentration is low in the soil solution and therefore the nutrient availability is said to be low. Nutrient availability can depend on several soil factors. The nutrient levels in the bulk soil, the soil water availability, the soil pH, the percent clay and organic matter, and the nutrient buffering buffer capacity. Nutrient availability depends on plant factors such as soil volume explored by roots, secretion or cleating agents. Symbiosis with bacteria, particularly those of the nitrogen fixation family, and fungi. Primary and secondary deficiencies can exist in plants. These suggest low nutrient content of the soil because the parent rock is poor in that nutrient. This is called a primary deficiency. An example of this may be copper deficiency in a sandy soil. The nutrient is present in sufficient amount but not available in the form required and this is referred to as a secondary deficiency. An example of this may be manganese and zinc deficiency in alkaline soils. Primary deficiencies are easily treated, but the main cause for secondary deficiencies must be addressed before availability of soil nutrient can increase. Here we have an example of a major deficiency. The grain yield varies depending on the nutrients available to the plant. Where there was no zinc and no nitrogen, the grain yield was at 290 megs per plant. If nitrogen was added with no additional zinc, the grain yield jumped from 290 to 1310 mg per plant. If however zinc was added and no nutrient and no nitrogen supplied, the grain yield was at still at 290 mg per plant. The optimal grain yield in this case study was achieved by adding additional nitrogen and additional zinc where the grain yield was then 1,770. This would be an economically ideal situation. A second example is shown in the major deficiency of phosphorus and nitrogen. Here we can again see that phosphorus and nitrogen um, shoot dry mass will alter depending on what is available to the plant. The ultimate shoot dry mass production in this case study is optimal phosphorus and optimal nitrogen. Plant nutrients can be characterised according to their ability to move within the plant. Some nutrients can move easily, for example from old leaves to younger leaves, or from old leaves to buds, and these are considered mobile. That is, they are mobile in the phloem of the vasculum tissues. Examples of mobile nutrients include nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, sodium and calcium. Nutrient deficiency appears first in the older leaves for these nutrients. This is because the nutrient is remobilized to the young organs to maintain their growth. Some nutrients are mostly insoluble forms in senescing leaves and these are considered non-mobile or immobile and are not taken up by the phloem. These include calcium, manganese, iron and boron. Nutrient deficiency appears first in the younger leaves as the nutrient cannot be remobilized. Some nutrients have variable mobility. These include, include sulfur, zinc, copper and molybdenum. So in summary, nutrient deficiency and toxicity results from an imbalance between nutrient supply, that is nutrients availability, available in the soil, and nutrients demand for growth. Correct interpretation of plant symptoms can help determine which nutrient is most efficient. Plant and soil analysis are also necessary to confirm conclusions based on plant symptoms. Eliminating a nutrient deficient re deficiency requires a good understanding of its cause. The nutrient may be present in the soil but not available for the plant uptake because of other factors. This includes pH, soil moisture, etc. How do nutrients move in the soil? Well, most of the nutrient uptake by plant involves some movement of the nutrients towards the roots. Nutrient uptake by direct contact between the soil and the root usually represents a very small proportion of the total plant uptake. Nutrients move to the roots by mass flow and by diffusion. 
the relative importance of these two processes varies for each nutrient. Nutrient uptake by roots involves the movement of nutrients in the soil solution to the root surfaces. Root uptake, which depends on the size of the root system and root activity, including symbiotic relationships, and radical movement of the nutrients in the root tissue towards the xylem vessels and the trees for long distance transport to the rest of the plant. The image on the slide represents the relationship between the nutrient concentration in the soil and the distance from the root surface. The closer the roots are, to the nutrient concentration source, the better their ability will be to uptake the roots. The further away the roots are from the nutrient soil, the lower their ability to uptake nutrients by the roots. There are different forms that different nutrients can be taken up in. For example, potassium and phosphorus are shown in the table. About 10% of phosphorus is taken up by direct contact, 1% by mass flow, while most of the uptake is by diffusion. This is similar to potassium, with 9% taken up by direct flow, 10% by mass flow, and 81% by diffusion. The forms of nutrient uptake in the soil have impacts or implications for the root systems. Some nutrients are very localised in the soil, for example, potassium, phosphorus, zinc and copper. And others are easily leached, for example, nitrate. Plants need to develop root systems which are extensive enough to acquire the immobile nutrients and avoid excessive leaching of the mobile nutrients. It's a bit of a compromise. Roots proliferate in the topsoil where most of the nutrients are localised. Plants that develop extensive root systems do this to obtain both water and nutrients from the soil. To give you some kind of idea about the mass, winter rye grown for four months contains 13 million primary and lateral roots extending 500 kilometres in length and providing an area of 200 metres square. Pretty impressive. There are over 10 to the 10 root hairs providing another 300 metres squared surface area. 500 metres squared surface area of roots is 100 times greater than the plant's leaf surface. Root length density is equal to the total length of the root per unit volume of soil. It is represented by L. L is large in surface layers and decreases with depth. Grasses have a very high root length density in surface layers but very low below one meter. Perennial and trees have lower root lo length density than grasses in surface layers but higher root length density at depth. The biomass allocation to roots will depend on the availability of nutrients and water. At one extreme, plants grown in hydroponics will, with adequate nutrients often allocate only three to five percent of the total biomass of roots. Water and nutrient stress plants may invest as much as 90% of the biomass in roots. More commonly, plants allocate 30 to 50% of the total biomass of roots. This is certainly worth considering in an economic perspective. If your crop is an above ground crop and you are putting most of your resources to below ground, you are losing your optimal. However, if you do not put adequate resources into below ground, you will not be able to utilise your nutrients effectively and therefore you will lose economically in your above ground. It is a compromise. So in summary, it is essential to understand the role of nutrients in physiological processes. What do we mean by adequate, limiting and excess concentrations? We have reviewed the movement of nutrients in both plants and soils, and these are important to obtaining adequate nutrient levels. Nutrient uptake is dependent on roots, the root mass and the root architecture, and these govern many aspects of root growth and development. And often from a commercial aspect, it is a compromise between a physiological outcome and a commercial interest 
and there are situations where these are not always the same. This brings us to the end of this lecture.